So the first question was an interesting question that I think some of you got and it stumped some of you. Um, so this is introducing you to using square roots, which you already know, and then cubed roots. So remember that a square root, when you're answering it, you're thinking of what number times itself will give me the thing under the root sign. So for example, if it was square root of 9, what number times itself gives me 9? And that would be 3 times 3. A cubed root then works very, very similarly. It just means what number times itself three times will give me what's under the root sign. Um, so for example, this is showing you eight. Two times two times two gives you eight. And so the cubed root of eight is two. So one thing that you want to think about then, with the number three, whoops, I get a pen, with the number three to the six, let's break that number down into what number times itself will give me 3 to the 6, and then what number times itself 3 times will give me 3 to the 6. This is where knowing your exponent rules comes in, knowing that when you multiply, you add. And so really, to get 6, we're thinking, oh, 3 plus 3. And so that means the square root of 3 to the 6, this number here, is going to be 3 to the 3. Now let's think about what number times itself three times will give me three to the six. Again, think about the power to a power rule. And again, we're thinking adding. So basically what number time up adds up to six? Well, that's two plus two plus two. And so that means the cubed root of three to the six is three to the two. So really this question is just asking you what's three to the three minus three to the two, or what's 27 minus nine? And the answer for that one is 18. Now, just as an aside for anyone that's interested, another way of writing square root, so in math, when I write square root of some number, another way of writing that is that number to the exponent of a half. So another way of writing cubed root of some number is that number to the exponent a third. So another way of looking at this question is square root of 3 to the 6 minus cubed root of 3 to the 6. This can be rewritten like that, and this one can be rewritten like that. Then you can apply the power to a power rule. That becomes 3 to the 3, and that becomes 3 to the 2, and you can get the same answer. So that, I know, might be complicated to some of you, but it's just, again, something interesting to learn something new about how to write roots. Roots can be written with this symbolism, but they can also be written with this symbolism, which is a little bit of grade 11 math for you, um, a little bit of an extension. So let's look at this one here. Um, so probability, we do some work with probability, but we don't do a ton of it. And so I think a lot of you struggled a bit with this question. Um, one way of doing it, uh, which probably would make the most sense to many of you, is to make a tree diagram. So you know that you can land on the 1, the 2, the 3, the 4, or the 5. So the spinner can land on one of those numbers. Now it says if it lands on a perfect square, you are then able to flip a coin. If it doesn't, you're done. So this one is not a perfect square, not a perfect square, not a perfect square. I think some of you were thrown off by the number 1. 1 is a perfect square. 1 times 1 is 1. Likewise, 4 is a perfect square. 2 times 2 is 4. So all of those numbers, um, 1, 4, 9, 16, um, 25, etc. Those are all perfect squares. So now it lands on this, we can flip a coin. So we can say heads or tails. Heads or tails. Now keep in mind here, these were possibilities that just didn't work out for you. So you've got to still kind of keep those in the back of your head as total number of outcomes. When And then it says probability that you flip a coin and it lands heads up. So we've got there and there. But remember, we did have all of these outcomes that just didn't work, that weren't a perfect square and a head flip. Um, so we have 10 outcomes in total, and two that were the ones we wanted, which gives us a probability of one out of five. Another way of doing this, uh, which you would learn later on, I think probably not until oh gosh, I think probably grade 12 data management maybe, is doing some other work with probability, um, which is looking at what's the probability when you spin the spinner you will get a perfect square? That would be two out of five. There are two out of five numbers on that spinner. And then what's the probability of getting heads? That's one half. 
When you have multiple outcomes, you can actually just multiply the probabilities together. When you do that, you end up with one-fifth. So it's just another way, again, something a little bit of an extension for you, looking at probabilities of multiple outcomes really are just what's the probability of each outcome and then multiply them together. Um, the third one, uh, I, I can't remember... Not a lot of you got it right, I don't think. Some of you did, some of you didn't. The easiest way to approach questions like this is to do a test number. So let's pretend the volume or the length of each cube was X, right? Because you're increasing by 10%, the easiest sort of test number is to say, let's pretend right now each length is 10. So let's just for argument's sake say, say each length is 10. That means if each length was 10, the volume is 10 cubed, or 10 times 10 times 10, which is 1,000. So that would be the volume of a cube that has a length of 10. Now let's look at what happens when we increase it by 10%. 10% of that 10, remember the easiest way to do 10% is just to move the decimal place once. So 10% of 10 is just 1. So that means our new length, it's going to be 11. Our new volume then will be 11 cubed, or 11 times 11 times 11. That one you might not get as quickly in your head. Um, you might have to write it out or whatever, or if you know your squares and cubes, you might get it quickly. Regardless, you are capable of getting that number, and you'll get 1331. So now what we need to do is say, okay, we were at a thousand. We're now at 1331. How much have we increased by? Well, we've increased by 331. We've increased by new volume minus old volume. How do we express that as a percent? Well, we take the volume increase divided by the original volume. Remember, percent is always um, like if you think of a test, what you got on the test divided by the total marks. So in this case, it's asking us volume increase, but what is it that's increasing? It's the original. So we always take our volume and divide it by the original. When we do that, really, we know percents out of 100, so we can really get rid of that zero, which means we have to move the decimal place there. So it's going to be 33.1%. Now, the interesting thing with this question is I chose 10 for my original just because I knew that was an easy number. If you chose 20, if you chose 30, it doesn't matter what you choose because the, the question was asking for a percent increase. The percent increase stays the same regardless of the number. The amount of increase, this 331, that would change depending on the number, but the percent will always be the same. Um, so when you get questions like this, a really good strategy is to just pick a test number and try it out. And the best thing to do is to pick a test number that will be easy to work with. All right, so this one um, was quite an interesting one. Um, so you're looking for numbers where your middle two, so your tens and your hundreds place, are going to be the product will exceed six. Now, that language confuse some of you. Exceed six means more than six. So what we need to do is look at the numbers between 5,000 and 5,500 and think about what are some of the possibilities. Remember we've got a five there and we've got a whatever there. What are some of the possibilities for these two places? For this place I could have a zero, a one, a two, a three, or a four. Can't go higher because then I'm at you know, the 5,500, and I believe it said, let me just look that up, oh, it's actually here, it says between, so 5,500 doesn't count, you can't have exactly 5,500. So now your job is to think, okay, with each of these possibilities for my hundreds place, what ones will give me a product that exceeds six? If I had a zero there, nothing will give me a product that exceeds six, so that one's kind of done. What if I had a 1 there? What will exceed 6? Okay. So if I had a 1 there, I could have a 7, an 8, or a 9 for my 10's space. I can't have a 6 because that doesn't exceed. Now what if I had a 2 there? Well, I could have 4, 
I could have five, I could have six, I could have seven, I could have eight, or I could have nine. What about if it was a three? I could have three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, an eight, or a nine. And what if it was a four? I could have a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, an eight, or a nine. So these are all the possibilities. So I've got six there, I've got three there, four, five, six, seven there, and two, four, I've got eight there. So I've got a total of 24 possibilities. Okay. That just deals with my hundreds and my tens spot. Now, remember, I've got my ones digit. My ones digit really can be anything. Okay. It just has to be greater than 5,000. Now, remember, I can't have 5,000 because that zero didn't work. So really this number could be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Altogether, I've got, I think, 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Yes, there are 10 altogether. That means I could have, for example, five, one, seven, zero. 5, 1, 7, 1, 5, 1, 7, 2, and so on. I could have 5, 1, 8, 0, 5, 1, 8, 1, 5, 1, 8, 2, and so on. So that means for each of these 24 possibilities, I actually have 10 possibilities for my ones digit. So I actually have 24 times 10, or 240, possible whole numbers where this scenario will be applicable. So that's just some interesting kind of a strategy. Again, notice I wasn't finding each one. I was finding a pattern or strategy to be able to do it. There are too many numbers to be able to list each one. So the shortcut is to try to find an easier way. Find a strategy or pattern that will help me to get to the answer. Okay, so for this one, I've, draw, I've redrawn the picture. Um, this one is quite complicated, uh, and I'm not sure how many of you really even knew exactly what to do. Um, the shading region, I didn't actually shade it, is this, whoops, it's not going to let me maybe, is this region right in here, okay? Um, so I'm going to just undo that for a second because I want to be able to show you something with that. Um, so a couple things that will potentially help you here is to split this up and draw a perpendicular line here, so a 90 degree angle there, and draw a 90 degree angle there. So what we've actually done by drawing those 90 degree angles, and this is not drawn to scale in any way, is I've created some right angle triangles. I've created a right angle triangle right here. I'll call this one, um, I don't know, A, B, C, D, E. I'll call this point F. And I'll call this point G, let's say. So I've created a right angle triangle, A, B, um, oh, shoot, I already had that labeled. Ah. Now it's not going to let me, there we go. Okay, so sorry, I had this one already labeled as B here, so B is actually there. So let's call that one F, sorry, and that one G. So I created a right angle triangle AFB, which is this triangle right here, and I've created a right angle triangle AGD, which is this triangle here. Now, one thing it talks about is the center of the smaller square, okay? You're putting this, tr this square, this point A, is smack dab in the center of this smaller square, which I haven't drawn very well. But that means if this is smack dab in the center, that means this length from A to F has to be 4. Because if the whole length is 8, halfway, it's right in the middle, has to be 4. Likewise, if this is smack dab in the center, because it's a square, this side also has to be 4. Okay? The other thing you have to keep in mind is it gave you this measurement right here. So it told you that distance there. And again, if that distance is 5, this distance is also going to be 5. Okay? So that tells us some things about these triangles. We have Pythagorean theorem in play here. 
and we can do some calculating. So we can use the fact that we've got two congruent, which means the same. These two triangles are the same. We know that 5 squared minus 4 squared will give us 9, which means that this length will be 3. And if this length is 3, so is this length. So we've got some congruent right-angled triangles. That's the piece that I think many of you probably wouldn't have been able to see. That's really challenging to be able to kind of see that piece. Knowing that, then you know that this little bit, if that's 3, and you know that this is a square, that this little bit must be 1. Okay? And because it's a square, you know that this piece from E to G, because this is a square even though I didn't draw it very well, that this piece is 4. So I didn't draw it to scale very well, but this is supposed to be a square that's 4 by 4. The reason why we knew that again was this point A was right in the middle of this square. And so that means if it's right in the middle, this length is 4 and this length is 4, which makes this 4 and this 4. So now we have, and I'm going to outline it in green, I've got this shape right here that I need to find the perimeter of. Well, now I know that it's 5 plus 3 plus 4 plus 1 plus 5, and it is 17, nope, 18. Okay, so that is the answer to that question. That's quite a challenging question. Um, it has to do with the fact that that point was right in the middle. That allowed you to create these right angle triangles and this square that was 4 by 4. Using Pythagorean theorem, you were able to know that that missing piece was 3 and that this missing piece was 1, and you could go from there.